Sorry for the long interesting or int introduction prayer, but uh, did you know that? Um, it's been a while since we looked at that. 2001, September 11th, the enemy was literally let in the walls and the gates of this nation. There are two nations I'm aware of that were deliberately founded upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel is one. Can you think of who the other one was? It was America. It absolutely was. And the terrible travesty of that day, over 3,000 Americans were killed, or I should say people were killed. And then um, we did, those politicians in that next election cycle that visited Ground Zero, a couple of them actually cited Isaiah chapter 9, and they didn't even know that what they were doing was something... Here's what Israel did. Oh, yeah, so they knocked over our sycamores. We're going to build it. We're going to replant it with a cedar, an evergreen. And uh, instead of bricks, we're going to rebuild it with stone. It's kind of this, Lord, we're going to build it bigger, better, faster, stronger. They weren't listening. Why was Israel breached in the first place? Because of their sin and idolatry. And they didn't listen. And watch the 19-year cycles that happened after that. So when I recently found out that the tree they planted at St. Paul's Chapel, the evergreen tree, had died, I thought, oh, Lord, time to redouble our efforts for intercessory prayer. Wouldn't you think? Is God trying to tell us something? What can we learn with the book of Job, chapter 28? Remember, chapters 26 through 32 is Job's last speech to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Chapters 32 through 37, yeah, here comes the fourth critic and to Job's situation. That's a boy that we'll know by the name of Elihu. So chapters 38 through 41, finally God shows up and he tells Bildad, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Elihu, you guys were dead wrong. My servant Job was right. Well, anyway... Here's Job, he's continuing. He's still bewildered by what God is doing. Chapter 28, verse 1. Surely there is a mine for silver, and there is a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth, and copper is smelted. Copper mixed with tin is going to give you bronze. So this is him talking about the leading sort of technology of the time, bronze. Hey, that's your bronze age. Or for your anthropologists, uh, that's going to be roughly 3300 uh, B.C. to about 1000 B.C. Bronze Age uh, follows the Stone Age, and then the Iron Age will take over after the Bronze Age. But here, yeah, copper, yeah, that's a really valuable, valuable ore. Verse 3. Man puts an end to darkness. In other words, when they're uh, mining in, Christian might get a kick out of this, lamp or torch, we can, deep, we can dig deep into the earth because we can take the darkness away by our, by our torches and lamps and search as every recess for ore in the darkness and the shadow of death, if you will, deep mines. Verse 4, he breaks open or digs a shaft away for people in places forgotten by feet, they hang, if you will, on long ropes far away or space between the men, and they swing to and fro. Job is describing an extensive mining operation, man's cleverness and ingenuity, right? Keep reading. Verse 5. As for the earth, or on the surface, from it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Yeah, the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. Verse 6, now its stones under the surface of the earth are a source of sapphires, and it contains gold dust. That path no bird knows, nor has the falcon's eye seen it. So from above, the sharp-eyed falcons, they can see the treasures below the surface. Where is uh, Job going with this? Verse 8, the proud lions have trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over, really, that is to say, treaded on it. Verse 9, and he, the humans, they put his hand on the flint. Um, he knows how to break rocks, in other words. And he, or humans, overturn the mountains at the roots. They can dig deep into a mountain. He, the humans, 
They cut out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. Humans light up, ooh, gold, silver, copper ore, uh, rubies, and diamonds, etc. The humans, verse 11, they can even dam up the streams from trickling. What is hidden, he brings forth to light. Because where do you find your gold deposits very often? At the bottom of a stream or a river. Humans can dig deep into mountains, divert mighty rivers to expose gold, verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? Oh, if only you could dig that out of a mountain. And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. This is interesting. Job is saying, Man are humans brilliant when dreaming up marvelous machines and enterprises to find treasure. They'll break their backs chasing riches, but completely miss out on the real treasure, wisdom. So he's looking right at Bildad and Zophar and uh, Eliphaz, verse 14. The deep or the ocean says, it, or wisdom, is not in me. And then the sea goes on to say, it is not within me. Verse 15, it cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It, or wisdom, cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, the purest form of gold in this region. In precious onyx or sapphire, neither gold nor crystal, like diamonds and gems, can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. Wisdom. Verse 18, no mention shall be made of coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Wisdom. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? If only we could sink a mine shaft and go get us some. Job is saying, wisdom is way more valuable than anything. Yet people barely lift a finger to find it. They'll break their back hunting for gold and copper and silver, dimes and rubies. How crazy is that? Verse 21. Wisdom is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death, hell and the grave. They say, we have heard a report about it, finding wisdom, with our ears. Verse 23. God understands wisdom's way and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heaven. To establish a weight for the wind. In other words, uh, God decides how hard wind should blow. God decides that. And a portion of the waters by measure, God decides how much rain should fall. Verse 26, when he made a law for the rain and a path for the lightning bolt, when he saw wisdom and declared, really established it, he prepared or he invented wisdom. Indeed, he searched it out. He designed it. Verse 28, And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Hey, you don't have to dig deep into a mountain and break your back months and months of digging sweat and toil to find wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil. That is understanding. Hey, praise God. Uh, in Job's day, the Holy Spirit was not poured out universally like he is now. Um, after Jesus paid for everybody's sin, all sin has been paid for. Now, Christians, if you're born again, you have the Lord living in your heart. So you have the Holy Spirit inside saying this is the way or that is the way. And if you're not saved, then that universal nature, presence of the Holy Spirit around everybody, what's the Holy Spirit doing? He is nudging. He is <laughs> him. He is convicting every non-believer of sin, which you shouldn't be doing, of righteousness, which you should be doing, and there is a judgment day. We have that benefit 
Job did not. Why did he love God so deeply? It's hard to say, really, but I want you to know this for sure. He figured something out long ago. We're going to see later in this section that he loved God at a very young age. And he figured out something. You know how you get wisdom? And because if you have wisdom, you get everything else. Well, where do you get it? It starts with a fear of the Lord. That's where the wisdom is. And then do what you know how to do. Call on God to help you. Lord, how do I walk away from evil? It's an interesting question to start your day before you get into your Bible each day. Lord, I want to learn what you love and I want to do more of that. And Lord, I want you to teach me what you hate and help me do less of that. That was Job's lifestyle, it would seem. And before chapters 1 and 2, had God blessed him and was there a certain fulfillment in his life? Absolutely. Proverbs 9, verses 10 and 12 say this. Fear the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. You know who said that? That was Solomon. Because he walked on the wild side for a good portion of his life. Started out great, you know. And then God gave him one of the toughest tests there is. What's that? Tougher than Job? Yeah, I kind of think so. What test is tougher than Job? It was the test of prosperity in Solomon's case. Job was prosperous as well. He's going to get tested when God removes his prosperity. When was Solomon tested? Remember, when he first gets started, he's going to be the king. He's shaking in his boots and hiding in his tent. God finds him on inauguration day. God says, probably Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord. He says, Solomon, what are you doing in here? Solomon, I don't know that I should be the king. I don't know if I have what it takes. God, ask anything, Solomon, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, you know what I need, Lord? I don't even know when to go in or come out. I don't even know when to stand up or sit down. I need, you remember what he asked for? Wisdom. And God said, well done, Solomon. And so he started out, <clears throat> did Solomon, with humility, and he became the most, the richest human on the planet the planet had ever seen. And they prospered so much in Israel, so much of Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 and following happened. He followed after the Lord. And God blessed him, and he was the smartest guy, so brilliant that kings and queens would come from other parts of the world. How are you pulling this off? They had so much gold that silver was, oh, kind of seen as an inferior product. But then what happened to Solomon? After he had all of that stuff, where did he go? God said, um, now, don't um, add to yourself, if you're the king of Israel, do not add to yourself horses, especially horses from Egypt, and do not multiply to yourself wives. Well, what did Job, or what did Solomon do? He had a lot of horses, and he had a lot of what? Wives. And pew, he goes right down the tubes. But fortunately, he remembers what his mom in Proverbs 31 says said to him, now Solomon, my son, watch out for the women, watch out for the gold, watch out for the horses. And he remembered what mom had said, Bathsheba, and he finally does repent at the very last end of his life. Uh, hold your finger here and go to, we're going to go, oh, what am I doing in Amos? Uh, well, you're in Job, uh, go to the right, um, go past uh, the Proverbs that he wrote, and look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. 
I've got this one highlighted, several colors in my Bible. Look what he says, the smartest, wisest guy who ever lived ever. Verse 13. Let us hear then the conclusion of the whole matter, said the smartest man who ever lived. He was smarter than Jeff Bezos and uh, all the rich billionaires combined. He could do anything he wanted, and he did. University training, school training, party, getting nuts, uh, all the women, all the horses, all the everything he had. And you know what he finally figures out at the very end of it all? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments. He started out as the wisest man ever. That wisdom took him down a track of self-indulgence, and he almost killed himself. He finally remembered, where does fulfillment come from? Oh, yeah, here it is. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Back to the book of Job. A Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 says, In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And John Corson said something so cool here, I just had to read it. John Corson on this section says, Everything you need to know about how to get through the rest of this day or tomorrow will be found in God and his word. In talking to him, by walking with him and being in awe of him. The fear of the Lord is not an abstract concept. The fear of the Lord simply says, Lord, you're awesome. And you are holy. And you are gracious. And you are good. And I need you desperately today, Lord. So... I'm going to begin this day with you because in you are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If we do not fear God, then we will fear everything else. Ah, well said. Chapter 29, verse 1, Job further continued his discourse and he said, Oh, Oh, that I were as in the months past, as in the days when God watched over me. Now, we know that God is still watching over him, but where he sits, he's like, I'm not so sure that he is. Verse 3. When his lamp shone upon my head, oh, I remember those days. And when his light, and by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when my friendly counsel of God was over my tent, verse 5, when the Almighty was yet with me, and when my children were around me. Remember, he lost his kids in that terrible storm, chapter 1, verse 6. When my steps were bathed with cream, ice cream, and the rock, <clears throat> and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me, I remember vines and often olive trees uh, were sort of a, grew up in the cracks. And so that's a reference to that. Verse 7. And when I went out to the gate by the city, oh, when I took my seat in the open square. I remember the city gate was kind of the city hall of its age. And so he evidently had a seat on the city council. Verse 8. The young men saw me and hid. Really, they stepped aside. Well, here comes Job. So they, in respect, they sort of stepped aside a little bit. And then the aged rose and stood. Well, here comes Job. And they thrust out a hand. How you doing, Job? Verse 9. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand to their mouth. And their voice of nobles, the highest officials, was hushed. And their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouth. In other words, they were quiet. They were hanging on my every word. That's what that means. Before he lost everything, Job's wisdom and insight and advice was highly regarded. I remember when important people sought out my counsel. 
But now, like you, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, you think I'm deluded and crazy. Uh, Job continues to remember and reminisce. When the ear heard, and then it blessed me. And when the eye saw, and then it approved me. He said, tell people this and that, and then they would do this and that, and then they would be blessed. And they'd come back and they'd say, thanks, Job, that's awesome. Verse 12. Because I delivered the poor who cried out. Do you remember that uh, it was Bildad who said, are you sure you're not, uh, did you take advantage of the poor? He said, no, I delivered the poor who cried out. The fatherless and the one who had no helper. Verse 13. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing and rejoice. Both Bildad and Zophar accused Job, Job of ripping off the poor. And taking advantage of widows. No, says Job, my counsel and aid rescued many from disaster. Verse 14. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me, and my justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, I was feet to the lame, I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that did not know, or that I did not know. So we see that he was actually quite a, uh, a philanthropic kind of guy. Uh, he used his great wealth, evidently, for many folks. Verse 17, I broke the fangs of the wicked, and I plucked the victim from his teeth. He's saying, I lived righteously, you guys. I walked wisely. I helped the blind and the lame. I helped those lost in the legal system or failing businesses. I stood against evil and I helped these people. And my wisdom saved many out of huge trouble. Okay? Verse 18. And then I said, I shall die in my nest. In other words... I'm going to be surrounded by loving family and multiply my days as the sand. I'm going to live a long life. Verse 19, my root is spread out to the waters and the dew lies all night on my branch. I was a healthy tree full of fruit that fed me, my family, and a bunch of other people too. Verse 20, my glory is fresh within me and my bow is renewed in my hand. Um, and a reference to my kids. My kids were, were doing pretty well as a rule, and they energized me. Verse 21. Men listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel. And after my words, they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them as due. They had nothing to add. They were basically saying, wow, Job, that's awesome. Verse 23. And then they waited for me as for the rain. And they opened up their mouth wide as for the spring rain. My counsel gave them peace and hope. Verse 24, and if I mocked at them, in other words, if I joked with them, they did not believe it, and the light of my countenance they did not cast down. When they were deeply discouraged, my exhortation lifted them. I came alongside people. Who are struggling? Not like you guys, not like you, Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz. Verse 25, I chose the way for them and sat as chief. So I dwelt as a king in the army as one who comforts mourners. Man, I was a leader. I was a team builder. And everything I did, I did for God in his glory. It's interesting that more than 15 times in the book of Genesis, pardon me, the book of Deuteronomy, God commands Moses, remember. Interesting that God says to Moses, who at times, did he have often opportunities for grand discouragement? Oh, man. The people, did they sort of bless Moses as a rule or did they grind on him? And so like any leader at times, it just is withering. Sometimes, especially you tell people ABC and it will turn around and they go, okay, thanks. And they don't do ABC. They do something completely different, blow up their lives and they come back. Pastor Steve, can I get some more counsel? Sure. Hopefully this time it'll turn out different. 
More than 14 times, the book of Deuteronomy, God commands Moses, stop for a minute and remember. Remember how faithful I have been. Um, in my Bible right here, I have Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. And I've got it a little highlighted. Many of you know this off the top of your head. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Then what happens? And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Man, I don't get it will guard your heart, your emotions, and your mind. Ever have a hard time sleeping? Uh, uh, the psalmist says, I feel like a door on a hinge. I'm on the flop on this side and that side and this. I can't go to sleep because the thing keeps cruising through my mind. You need to be guarded. How do you do that? With thanksgiving, Start thanking God for all the things that you do have. When discouragement is pounding on your door and threatens to come in like a SWAT team and apprehend every thought of yours, one of the best tools against discouragement and hopelessness, stop for a minute and like Job is doing, kind of, remember, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because like Job, God has allowed these things to happen in your life not to blow you up. He's doing it for a number of important reasons. Some of those reasons are about you. Many of those reasons are not about you at all. In the case of Job, it's about those people watching you. We postulated that one of the reasons that Eliphaz, Zophar, and um, Bildad, their actual accusations against Job are probably from what's called evil suspicion. My hunch is that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar are the things that they have been accusing Job of doing. Can't say for sure, but I wonder. It's a thing, you know, when God brings a person into your life that really gets under your skin, an employer, a neighbor, who knows what it might be. It's a thing that God brings someone to you that is guaranteed to get under your skin and really do a deep work in you. How does you know that? Because it's somebody who is like you. It's a fascinating thing. The people that you have the strongest reaction to often is a mirror that God has brought to your life. I think that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar have been so rough on Job. You know, you are Job, you're this and you're that and you're this. You are squeezing the widows and the orphans and you're doing the thing with the money. You're consumed, you're hiding some sin. And Job's all, no, I'm not. My hunch is the reason they had three full rounds each is because I think that's what they are struggling with. So all that is to say when God allows these challenges I like what Job is doing here. He's reminding himself of when God was very, very faithful. And then there's Philippians. When hopelessness is try to grab you, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, look around your life and thank him. There may be a number of things you don't have because it's not good for you yet, but he has given you plenty of things that you can thank him for. Would you agree with that? And when you do, your heart changes. Then the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Remembering what he has done and being thankful for what you have are powerful tools to defeat discouragement. Chapter 30. But now they, the preview one, the all the previous people that have I, all the people that previously I have helped, but now they mock me. Oh, okay, all right. Wait a minute, Job, you're doing so well. You're remembering all the faithfulness of God. I, um, I wrote in my margin, bummer, uh, poor me glasses. That's what he's wearing. 
I don't know what the time stamp is. I don't know how long it was between he got done penning 20, chapter 29 and 30. Was it because he was genuinely feeling those things? And then what does the enemy do? Does the enemy let anything God does in your life go unchallenged? And usually he'll do something, then you're back in the bummer thing. Or was he remembering what he just remembered, but on his nose he's got poor me glasses? What are poor me glasses? It appears that Job was reviewing, get what, get what I say there, viewing. He's reviewing again all the good things God had done. But is Job looking through poor me glasses? <laughs> if I have poor me glasses on, no matter what God shows me, it looks polluted, ruined, and hopeless. and just adds to my despair. What's the definition of faith, everybody? The absolute certainty that God is moving. Amen? But here's Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred, set aside, makes the heart sick. I wonder, does he have poor me glasses on? Hey, where do you get your poor me glasses at? Uh, it's in the God is not fair store. That's where you pick them up. And by the way, uh, they're on the, I so deserve better than this aisle. <laughs> by the way, um, what do we actually deserve? Careful, and we think, I think I deserve better than you or that or them. By the way, what do we actually deserve? Hell and separation. So every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father. What do I get me some of those poor me glasses? You go to the God is not fair store. <laughs> and they're on the I so deserve more and better aisle. And they're right next to I want more of what God has already given me plenty of. It's right between that and even if I have a hundred thousand of these, it still wouldn't fix what's really missing. That's where you find your poor me glasses. You ever had that? Um, I don't know about you, but that is a constant thing. The voice sneaks in often, so quiet. I'm driving along or walking along or just thinking about stuff. And then here it comes. Yeah, they did such and such. You know, those people that I just helped, the ones that I was uh, hired a lawyer on behalf of, the one who I gave business advice, and, and now their business is doing great, and they're doing great, but now they mock me. That's poor me glasses, because you can almost hear the little, there, there. So I'm driving along, and then I'm replaying some incident, and I begin to hear that little voice. After all you did for them, and that's what they're going to do you, doesn't that make you mad? Isn't that awful? You should probably just, who needs ministry, dude? You ever hear that voice? There, there. You have a case. You deserve better. No. When I start to hear that voice, I've, I've taken to doing this out loud. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the stronghold of poor me. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. I don't deserve better. I actually deserve separation and darkness. That goes alongside with be thankful for what you have. Because sometimes the poor me glasses will go on and you look at your spouse. Yeah. I don't deserve this. And then you begin to sneer. It's a good time to say, whoa, do I have poor me glasses on? I rebuke that poor me in Jesus' name. Try it next time. I wonder if that's what's happening to Job, because watch what he does here. All that beautiful remembering of what God, how God had used him. Now look, look where it turns. But now they, everyone I helped and blessed, they mock me. Men younger than I, whose fathers I disdain to put with my dogs of my flock. They were such terrible businessmen, I wouldn't put them in charge of my dogs that watch the flock. Indeed, verse 2, what profit is the strength of their hands to me? Their vigor has perished. They are gaunt 
for want and famine, fleeing late into the wilderness, desolate and waste. What he's saying is, if it wasn't for me, this would be the condition of those people. They're doing great. It is because of me, Lord. Pour me glasses. There, there. You deserve better. You know, if it wasn't for me, they'd be plucking greens by the bushes and the broom tree roots for their food. And if it wasn't for me, they would be driven out from among men, shouted at them as a thief. They would, they ha, they would be living in clefts of the valleys, in caves of the earth and the rocks. And among the bushes, they would be braying yeah, like, a, like a donkey. <laughs> Under the nettles they nestled. They are sons of fools, just sons of vile men. They were scourged from the land. The same people now mocking me. If it wasn't for my help, they would have ruined their businesses, their families, and their lives. And instead of prospering and being happy and fulfilled, they'd be poor, hungry, and homeless. That's what he's saying. Verse 9. And now... I am their taunting song. These guys are looking down their nose at me. They'd be nothing if it wasn't for me. And now they're singing a taunting song to me. Would that get under your skin? That's why you got to be careful of those poor me glasses. And now I am their taunting song. Yes, I am their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me, and they do not hesitate to spit in my face. Ding. Wait a minute. Could this be a model? I think it is. I see a model here. It's a model of Jesus. What do you mean? The very people Jesus would soon be dying for their sin. And the same people if they would just receive his salvation, his leading, his wisdom, would they prosper? But instead of being saved and healed and restored, instead of being graceful, what did they do? Many of them at the cross, they spit right in his face. Verse 11. Because he, God, has loosed or cut my bowstring, so I can't, don't have any weapons, and afflicted me, those that are mocking me, they have cast off restraint before me. At my right hand, the rabble arises. They push away my feet. They shove me to the ground. Remember when they used to throw to step aside and they said, no, here comes Job, he's, you know, he's really helped me out. And then the potentates would rise and shake his hand, now they are shoving him off of his feet. Shoving him. Get out of the way. Wow. And they raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up or they block my path. So instead of parting out of respect, they say, walk around, loser. They promote or brag about my calamity. They have no helper. In other words, no one is kind to me. Remember when he was rich, all that in a bag of chips, you know, everybody was nice to him. But now, no one is. Verse 14. They come as broad breakers. Uh, that's, a, that's a beach term. Um, rogue waves. Right, Blake? Yeah, you've got to watch out for them. You're standing there and you've got your back to say whatever and a rogue wave will come in from another direction and knock you right over. So they're like rogue waves coming at me from all directions. And they're the, under the ruinous storm, they roll along. Terrors are turned up upon me. I'm living in terror. They, pers they pursue my honor as the wind, and, they, and my prosperity has passed like a cloud. Remember when you were rich and powerful, Job, is what they're saying. It's all gone now, loser. Yeah, say something smart now, Mr. Councilman. Ha, ha, ha. And shove him off his feet. Mm. Verse 16. And now my soul is poured out because of my plight. The days of affliction take hold of me. My bones are pierced in me. My bones are full of pain, is what he's saying. 
and at night, and my gnawing pains take no rest. By, by great force, my garment, this is the Hebrew word lib ush, and here I believe it is figurative for his skin. And by great force, my skin is disfigured. It binds me about as the collar of my coat. And verse 19, he, God, has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer me. I stand up, and you regard me. I see him, but instead of, you know, okay, Job, I see you with pity, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your right hand, you have opposed me. You see me, you hear me, but you just respond with more pain. That's what he's feeling. Verse 22, you lift me up to the wind and you cause me to ride on it. What he's basically saying is you throw me right into the tornado. Like Dorothy. Da, 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 da. You get thrown right into the wind. You spoil my success for I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all the living. In other words, the grave. And surely he, God, would not stretch out his hand against a heap of ruins if they cry out when he destroys it. Surely God would not turn against the needy when they cry out for help, right? But that's what you're doing to me, God. Verse 25, have I not wept for him who was in trouble? He sure did. Have I, has not my soul grieved for the poor? It has. But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when they waited for light, then darkness came. Ever feel like that? I helped out needy people when they cried out. But now, when I'm in need, no one is helping me, not even you, God. Now, this is how it appears to Job. And can you blame him? He's lost everything. And now his skin, he's going to say here in a minute, is blackened. And there are a couple of medical conditions that could explain that. All of them have to do with pustules. All of them have to do with neuropathy. All of them have to do with tremendous discomfort. You can't even just sit quietly and still because your skin is on fire. And people are shoving you to the ground. And where was he at one time? He was one of the most respected men in all of the East, says Job chapter 1. Whew, wow. My heart is in turmoil and cannot see, cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me, verse 28. I go about mourning, but, do, but not in the sun. I stand up in the assembly or in a public square, and I'm asking and crying for help, and I am treated like a brother of jackals. And a companion of ostriches. I had no idea, but did you know that ostriches are dangerous and unpredictable? They are. So are jackals. That's how they're treating me. Look at verse 30. My skin grows black and falls off. My bones burn with fever. My harp is tuned, turned to mourning, and my flute to the voice of those who weep. You guys, this is real and reasonable feelings. But Job's answer is coming, amen? Like mine, it's coming. But before it does, can it get any worse? Yes. Starting next week, Elihu is going to show up. Oh, by goodness, by goodness. Amen. We did three chapters tonight. Lord Jesus, it is not easy reading these verses of a fellow human who has lost everything and even cannot sit in a, in a shaded place. He's got to stay out of the sun because the sun racks his skin even more. His skin is black and falling off. And the very people that he went out of his way to keep out of bankruptcy or jail 
are shoving him to the ground and mocking and even spitting. I don't know if a human can be at one point as a lofty of a level as Jake, as Job and then be this far down to the bottom. And so far, Lord, you haven't spoken to him yet. Truly, there's no test that has overtaken you, says the Apostle Paul, but what is common to man. It's hard for me to imagine Job's circumstance and situation common to anyone else who has ever lived. And that right there tells me, Steve, be careful of your poor me glasses. When they come on, they go on very subtly. The enemy is so skilled, so tender and gentle, just kind of letting those lenses slip in front of my eyes and my heart. Boy, do you have it rough. I do. You know, you deserve better than this. I do. And all those people that you have tried to help, now what are they doing? That's right, you say. Oh, may you see it. May it catch it soon. We saw it on Sunday a little bit. Before you want to pick up a rock and smash someone's skull with it because they deserve it. Oh, careful, says Jesus. As he writes in the dust, times when I have personally been guilty of that particular sin. Fascinating that this Sunday and now this Wednesday night, the lesson is still the same. Fall on the rock. Rebuke the poor me glasses. Grab the hem of his garment. Your answer is coming. Just keep showing up, Harvest. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen.